Okay, a few days ago I promised that I would try to make a video on training intensity zones. So this will be a short video trying to describe the way that we use training intensity uh, both in practical training and also in some of the research or essentially all of the research that we have published uh, from the group that I work with. So we use five intensity zones for the aerobic intensity range here in Norway. This is from the uh, Norwegian Olympic Federation. We think it's a good idea here to, to kind of have the same language even across different sports. Uh, there may be some small distinctions uh, comparing cycling versus running and so forth, but uh, having all the athletes and coaches speak the same language, uh, the, the, the benefits of that seem to outweigh the, the negative side. Now, looking at this, what I think is important for you to see is that there are three physiological anchor points that uh, we try to measure. Uh, one is the first lactate turn point, the second is the second lactate turn point, and the third is the VO2 max and heart rate max. Uh, we, you can also use ventilatory thresholds on these and we tend to use as a kind of a guide that this will be about 2 millimolar lactate uh, at the first uh, threshold turn point and about 4 millimolar or maximum lactate steady state at the second turn point. Those are approximations and they work reasonably well uh, at the group level but, but you need to measure these things at the individual level. Uh, and I'll discuss that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, and then you also have um, other zones, the, the distinction between zone 1 and zone 2 and zone 4 and zone 5, well, those are not based on physiological measurements, they're kind of just uh, practical um, uh, guidelines uh, based on experience and so that means that these zones are both a combination of physiology and practicality. And if you just want the physiology, then you would maybe only look at three zones. Uh, and I, I should also add that there are uh, three additional zones in the Norwegian model that are uh, for the anaerobic training uh, areas, anaerobic capacity training, anaerobic power, etc. And here heart rate goes out the window, you might say, uh, in this area. So that's the basic model that is used. Now in research we have typically just done this and presented three intensity zones based on these physiological uh, demarcation uh, variables that we're able to identify with laboratory testing. I think pedagogically for practical coaching this is actually also very useful. Just three intensity zones uh, for youth uh, athletes learning to understand training intensity discipline and distribution for recreational athletes. Three zones is probably enough and then if you're training a lot you may want to become a bit more sensitive and use the additional zones. Now the next thing and the last thing I want to talk about is the fact that these are generalizations uh, and you need to measure these at the individual level to really uh, do a good job with understanding your training intensity zone distribution. Um, so for example if I look at maximum heart rate if you use 220 minus age or one of these other regression equations uh, from population data you can easily make a pretty big error uh, and, and end up with an estimate of your maximum heart rate that is pretty far away from reality. Uh, this spread shows this when from 37 cyclists who were tested under identical conditions and then you, you compare their actual maximum heart rate with their uh, estimated and you see that the deviation is big enough that it could easily result in uh, pretty big errors in training intensity prescription if we were just to use the estimate. So if you're an endurance athlete whatever level you know be willing to to occasionally measure maximum heart rate uh, it plus or minus three beats there's going to be day-to-day -day variation there's going to be variability but if you can get it within that range then you're not going to make big mistakes in uh, your training prescription. So measure it at least once a year. The other issue is blood lactate. 
we use two and four millimolar as kind of guidelines but we know that there's some sport specificity here cyclists may have much uh, higher values at their maximum lactate steady state there's publications showing this and and highly trained endurance athletes may actually have a huge vo2 max but very low blood lactate levels at these turn points this is a case in point uh, these are uh, elite cross-country skiers from Norway. This is a, a sample of 16 athletes who all had data for the exact f same five running speeds during a lactate profile test. These are always performed for cross-country skiers in Norway at uh, a steep uh, treadmill incline, 10.5%, and low running speeds. Now what you should see if you look at these two uh, two y-axes is that the blood lactate concentration for these athletes male and female at low intensity is low it's uh, under one millimolar these are uh, corresponding to biosyn values or lactate pro values actually a lactate pro wouldn't even measure this low you would just get a low error signal but uh, 0.6 millimolar at low intensity and then a lactate turn point uh, corresponding to 1 to 1.3 millimolar blood lactate at 80% of max heart rate and 55 mLs per kg. So that's VO2 max for, for most recreational uh, athletes, uh, maybe even above that. At any rate, you need to measure these things to get it right. If these skiers were to use 2 millimolar or 4 millimolar as their estimates, they would severely overestimate their uh, appropriate training intensities for the threshold or for lower intensity and, and and that can also happen for regular folks like us if we don't uh, if we're not kind of true to the realities so I think I'll stop there